Good evening. My name is Uta Poige, and I'm the special advisor to the Provost on Humanics. And together with James Hackney, I also co-chair the university's Presidential Council on Diversity and Inclusion. And it is under that council that the series in which we are gathering today has actually run for more than 10 years, since 2013. It's a series that's entitled Conflict, Civility, Respect, Peace, Northeastern Reflects. And I'm really pleased that all of you have weathered the storms, so to say, and are here in person. And we know that multiple numbers of the crowd that we have here this evening are online with us today. And so it's really great that we have a panel of four of our colleagues who will be guiding our conversation today in the context of this um, series. So, um, the series always tries to draw an arc in all of its events, um, an arc from recognizing conflict or injustice to building peace. And today, at a time where the legal and policy paradigms for creating diverse student bodies are changing quickly and are also challenged, and where affirmative action, again, uh, faces many challenges, it is worthwhile to reflect on such challenges as well as to ask, as we are doing with today's event, how people and institutions can create a sense of belonging. Thus the title of today's event, The State of Affirmative Action, The State of Belonging. As I said, it's really wonderful to see so many of you here. I will just also say that this series has always had the ambition to create what one of the founding members um, talked about as civic sustainability. To, so really to think about how one can talk across difference, how one can talk across political divides, and also always to try and imagine solutions. We are certainly living at a time where such values and such practices are ever more important. I'm also curious whether a term that I heard in the context of the MLK event as a new value for Northeastern, at least from my perspective, last week, namely the term radical inclusion, will play any role in the ways in which we are thinking about both moving forward in the context of challenges to affirmative action and also with a desire to create belonging in our institution and in institutions more broadly. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to turn the mic over to our moderator for today, distinguished professor Ted Landsmark, who is also the director of the Dukakis Center. In this series, we always go pretty quickly, so we won't be doing lengthy introductions of our panelists, Libby Adler, Carl Reed, and Matt uh, Lee as well. And um, again, just many thanks to the four of you and to all of you for being here today for this conversation. Ted. Take it away. Oh, um, let me just say one more thing before I let Ted take it away. Those of us who are speaking in the room always need to wait for the mic to come. Our panelists have mics right here on the table, uh, but that's just important. And we need to continue to speak up because otherwise our audience that's in such numbers online will not be able to hear us. So with that housekeeping, Ted, finally let me turn to you. Thank you, Uta. Uh, thank you very much. It, it's... Um, not clear to me that uh, this panel would have taken place a quarter century ago. Um, and if it had, it's also not clear to me that the makeup of the panel uh, would be as uh, diverse um, as this particular panel is. Uh, many of us are beneficiaries of uh, decades of affirmative action uh, within higher education, within the corporate world, within the public sector. Um, and uh, to an extent within the private sector as well. Um, and we're clearly at a turning point um, in the history of the application of affirmative action rules and procedures um, uh, based upon what has happened within the Supreme Court and what is happening within national discourse uh, around uh, inclusivity, uh, affirmative action, and uh, a sense of belonging uh, that uh, folks have entered into discourse on um, over the past few years. Um, we're at a pivot point in American history, uh, a point that will uh, be transformative for um, who is participating in higher education and the corporate world, um, a pivot point in terms of 
how we uh, talk about and think about becoming uh, an increasingly uh, inclusive society within the United States. Um, my uh, questions to the panelists um, <clears throat> as we move forward will uh, disclose my own uh, viewpoints on the subject. Um, so I'm going to uh, turn this over immediately uh, to my uh, law school colleague, Libby Adler, who um, is a professor of um, law, um, women's gender and sexuality studies at our law school. Um, and I remind folks that we will open up for um, open discourse uh, after these presentations. So Libby, you're on. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you, Ted and Uta, for convening us. Um, I'm going to start us off by talking about the case, uh, the Students for Fair Admissions uh, versus Harvard and the University of North Carolina that came down this past June, uh, and in which the Supreme Court struck down two university admissions policies that would have been constitutional prior to this decision. Uh, this case uh, appears to possibly eradicate or at the very uh, least uh, drastically restrict university options uh, for diversifying their student bodies. Um, in addition to uh, uh, dealing us this setback for racial justice, the main point that I want to make uh, to start us off is that the court really failed in its most basic responsibility, which is to tell us what is and is not legal. Um, Chief Justice Roberts left us with a lot of conceptual gaps. So the first one um, that I want to highlight is that um, there's the problem of the opinion saying that uh, discussion of race uh, is allowed in an application essay, but not in such a way as to circumscribe the holding uh, of the decision. And this is just a conceptual tangle. Um, Chief Justice Roberts gave zero guidance to admissions offices. Uh, there may be some colleges and universities that will be glad that there's no real guidance, uh, and they can try various methods until they're told that those methods are unconstitutional. Um, we can definitely anticipate some more lawsuits uh, grappling with the limits of this area of permissiveness. Second, um, can universities pursue racial diversity using race-neutral means. Um, on the one hand, it seems like states might still be allowed to use things like what the University of Texas uses. They have something called a top 10% program, where if you graduate in the top 10% of your high school class in Texas, you get admissions to UT, uh, regardless of what high school uh, you went to. Um, but on the other hand, if that is driven by an effort to achieve racial diversity, then it kind of clashes with the logic of the decision. Uh, facial neutrality with a race conscious purpose should trigger what's uh, under the doctrine that we have, should trigger what's called strict scrutiny, which is basically the idea that the court approaches the program when it reviews it already suspicious uh, about its constitutionality. Um, there is a case in the pipeline right now that presents this issue. It concerns uh, the Thomas Jefferson Science and Technology High School in Virginia. This is a competitive admission magnet school uh, that tried to diversify using race-neutral means, relying, for, uh, for example, on the neighborhoods that the applicants come from rather than their race. That policy survived in the Fourth Circuit. Um, but a cert petition is pending. Um, I, I obviously don't know what's going to happen, but if the court thinks, as it seems to, that diversity is not a good enough reason for a university to employ racial categories, or, as it also seems to think, that achieving racial diversity impermissibly assumes that there's a black point of view or a Latino point of view then why would universities be able to pursue uh, racial diversity at all? If, there, if, if the um, school, if the Virginia high school loses that case, uh, I'm not sure it would any longer, for example, be constitutional to do recruitment in certain neighborhoods or through certain publications that were designed to recruit a diverse uh, uh, pool. Third, uh, the military seems to have been granted an exception. And the only explanation that Chief Roberts gives us for this is that military academies are not parties to the case. Uh, what's the rationale for setting the military apart? Chief Justice Roberts gives us nothing. Um, 
And finally, Chief Justice Roberts says uh, that Grutter, which was the leading case uh, before uh, last June, um, that Grutter is, um, uh, he never says that it is overruled. He never says explicitly that all race conscious admissions policies are unconstitutional. Justice Thomas says it in his concurrence. Justice Sotomayor says it in her dissent. But Chief Justice Roberts never says it. All he says is that Harvard and UNC policies do not survive strict scrutiny. So the question is, is he leaving an, an opening? So I'm not sure, if he is, I'm not sure what's going to fit into an opening that small, uh, which, which brings me to uh, uh, what I think has been the problem with constitutional evaluation of affirmative action all along. The legacy of slavery, of Jim Crow, of redlining, of, of, of the, and all of the other racist policies and, and practices that are part of our history is wildly diffuse. As Justice Jackson's dissent makes very vivid, it is felt intergenerationally in wealth and health, in education and beyond. Um, but constitutional law requires that the remedy for this massive, chaotic, and unmanageable legacy be narrowly tailored. Um, that was never going to work out, right? Um, this is not a tort like I didn't, you know, today this is a good example, like I didn't shovel my sidewalk, right? And then you walked by and slipped and fell. And we can know who the affected parties are, right? It's you and me. And, uh, and we can assign a pretty straightforward value to your injury and to my liability. Um, that model is not going to work for the history of racial injustice. Um, the court's conservatives are demanding something that they have to know is impossible. And if that is the demand, a tight and tidy remedy for something that is so uncabined and unwieldy, then what remedy is ever going to be constitutional? Right? I don't see what, apart from a highly individualized anti-discrimination claim, could survive such a cramped evaluation of such a monster of a problem with thousands of tentacles that just reach throughout our society. I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you. Carl Reed, <clears throat> our chief inclusion officer and uh, senior vice provost uh, addressing issues of uh, diversity and inclusion. Carl, you're on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Uta. Thank you to Ted also and, and to Jennifer for um, uh, hosting this uh, civility series. Um, I'll just say a quick word about radical inclusion. Uh, there is a reason why I was uh, really given the title of chief inclusion officer rather than chief diversity officer because we felt, and you'll hear this in my remarks, that diversity is a means to an end and that end is really inclusion and belonging. And so the reason that we, we, um, we, we, we chose that um, in addition to the fact that Northeastern does things in a unique way uh, in general, um, is really because of this. And so you'll hear that in my, my remarks consistently. Um, the other thing is I am a product of affirmative action. And, uh, and I'm, I'm a proud product of affirmative action uh, as well, one in which um, I don't think I would have uh, received an opportunity to get into MIT, to get into Harvard, based on my, my scores alone. Um, but there was a, a, a much more holistic assessment of who I was, mm -hmm. and I graduated with a bachelor and master's degree with a combined 4.7 out of 5.0, despite that SAT, those SAT scores, and a doctorate uh, in six years part-time uh, at that other school that, that is at the center of this case. Mm -hmm. So I am a product of this because someone really took a chance on me and, and created access and opportunity. Shortly, uh, the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion will be posting uh, its latest uh, blog post and Calypso uh, newsletter. And one of the things that I talk about was the use of dialogue to lower emotional temperature, um, that, that the power of dialogue. And I was just recently reading Peter Senge's Fifth Discipline about systems thinking. And one of the things that he does, he draws the distinction between dialogue and discussion. Dialogue, the etymology of dialogue is, is from the Greek of dialogos, of this idea of, of seeing through meaning, uh, thinking together. It's when people come together to really 
raise their collective learning, whereas discussion often is about debate. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a winner-take-all, heaving ideas one from the other. Um, and the whole notion of the civility series is one in which we really put forward dialogue. But dialogue is the key to belonging. It's a key to creating this, this environment where we have this discourse around ideas and conflict. Doesn't really mean that we all have to agree mm -hmm. to a point of view, but we, what we have a respect for each other uh, of equal status where we come together in this, uh, this, this series. Um, I want to begin by, um, and that was just a preview, I won't charge you for that. Um, <laughs> I want to be really begin by talking about the benefits of diversity. Let's start there. Let's start sort of at the basic. Um, that's the, the, the basic. So the, while the court challenged the stated benefits of diversity on the basis that they could not be subject, these benefits could not be subject to meaningful judicial review. I was using the language from the, from the. Yeah, I don't know what it means, but meaningful <laughs> division review. <laughs> Numerous researchers like Scott Page on team performance on problem solving and innovation. Anita Woolley on team intelligence, and practitioners like Franz Johansson, who coined the term the Medici effect, which is the intersection of ideas, um, and the birthplace of ideas occurs at the intersection of backgrounds and experiences, found measurable benefits associated with diversity of thought and identities. In last month's Calypso blog, I shared the major findings of McKinsey's latest report entitled Diversity Matters Even More, The Case for Holistic Impact. This report is the latest of their Diversity Matters series, which for the past eight years has demonstrated the link between leadership diversity and company performance. These studies show a progressive increase in the association between financial performance and the gender and ethnic diversity of their leadership teams. The latest report extends their study to include a company's impact on community, workforce, and environment. In other words, Across all industry surveys surveyed, more diversity of boards and executive teams in both gender and ethnicity is robustly correlated with higher social and environmental impact. So why is there a connection between diversity and these outcomes? Because as David Rock and Heidi Grant wrote in 2016, diverse teams are smarter. And there's a whole lot of research that shows not just company performance, but how diversity enhances the classroom experience, enhances the research experience, et cetera, et cetera, that I don't have time because they only gave me a fi five minutes. So but why is this important for this context? It's, it's, it's important because the diversity, as I mentioned earlier, is the path to belonging. Um, the key to why diversity matters is that it increases the likelihood of intergroup contact. This is Gordon Alport, Alport's work in the 1950s that he called the contact hypothesis. Alport discovered that discrimination, prejudice, and even our biases can be reduced by increasing social contact between individuals who hold different views or specifically come from different identity groups what they characterize as in-groups and out-groups. The contact hypothesis hypothe uh, fundamentally rests on the idea that in-groups who have more interactions with certain out-groups tend to develop more positive perceptions and fewer negative perceptions of that out-group. This is why I believe diversity is a necessary agreement to belonging or necessary assessment or ingredient to belonging. Diversity, which increases the likelihood of intergroup contact under certain conditions, will lead to a climate of inclusion and belonging, if certain conditions are met. And this contact has dual benefit. It reduces biases, biases and it fosters innovation. Because according to Scott Page, people are forced to think differently and harder when they're around identity diverse people. My fear is that this decision will have an insidious effect on the climate of inclusion and the feeling of belonging people of color and other historically marginalized groups experience now and for the foreseeable future. My fear is that institutions are overcorrecting for the SCOTUS decision. And I'm concerned that institutions are backing off on their commitments to welcome diversity, and by doing so, they're backing off on the I and the B of DEIB. And that concerns me. In industry, 
is already seeing, we're already seeing that, the reduction in number of positions are at that have diversity, equity, inclusion in their title, 44 percent reduction in the past year. Robert Sellers, the former chief diversity officer of the University of Michigan, likens diversity to being invited to a party. Equity is being invited to dance. Inclusion is influencing the playlist. <laughs> Belonging is how you feel at the party. Which brings me back to the power of dialogue. This is why we're prioritizing belonging. We want to dance. We want to experience this opportunity for us to have the engagement and learn and celebrate, not just to be invited to somebody else's party, but influencing the playlist. That is the culture. That is the climate of an institution. Belonging is a fundamental human need. And after breathing and eating and making sure that we have self, a safe shelf, shelter, belonging is a fundamental need. So it must be a shared belief, not the domain of one office or one officer or the leadership of an institution or department, but one for which we are collectively responsible. I'll close my remarks by sharing a quote from the U.S. Department of Ed Ed Education in their guidance department in the in the, uh, in the wake of the decision. Ensuring that institutions of higher education are open to all includes not only attracting, admitting, and matriculating a diverse student body, I'll add diverse faculty and staff, but also retaining students from all backgrounds. To that end, it is important that students, faculty, and staff, particularly those who are underrepresented, feel a sense of belonging and support once on campus. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Matt, you are a, um, a teaching faculty member, professor within the School of Public Policy here. Uh, give us some thoughts about uh, working within the classroom setting. These are two great, these are great presentations, by the way. Um, Glad I went before you, though. <laughs> no, well, this makes sense. Uh, I, uh, the order in which we presented this because I teach a class that's called Race, Identity, Social Change, and Empowerment. It's a class that's cross-listed through Human Services, which is my home program, as well as Africana Studies and uh, Sociology. Um, and so there's some didactic information that gets presented in a class like this. Of course, we, we review the history of why affirmative action was a necessary policy. We also review the several of the court cases, like Alan, the Allen Backey case, the, the Grutter case, Abigail Fisher case, as well as this current, the, the, the one that just um, uh, led to the uh, Supreme Court decision from last year. Uh, we then have sort of a simulation exercise that came from sociology where students form uh, uh, college admissions teams and review fictionalized um, materials from applicants. And the discussion is usually about how difficult the college admissions process really is because there are so many uh, valid and uh, qualified, in quotation marks, because how do you define qualifications? There's so many qualified um, um, applicants to, to university. And so one, th one trend that I think is, is, is new information to me from teaching here at Northeastern that is related to this most recent decision, uh, I speak, I'll speak on the two trends that I'm noticing in the classroom. Uh, one is that um, uh, students, when they think about college admissions, in, especially if they have some background in human services, sociology, and some of our other interdisciplinary and combined majors, students are asking questions not only about the admissions process, but they're asking about, but what next? Like, the emphasis should not only be on getting into the university, because that is no longer going to level the playing field. You want to make sure that any student who gets to that university feels a sense of belonging, has access, access to mentors, has access to people who look like them, research opportunities, um, uh, st content opportunities to learn about their own histories, psychologies, and identities in, the in the, their own classroom. There, there is a net benefit 
um, that we've seen in research on uh, taking ethnic studies classes for, for students who are BIPOC as well as non-BIPOC students from taking classes like this. So, so that's one trend that I'm noticing is students are asking about not just the college admissions process, but what, what are universities doing with funding and making sure that quality funding is available to first-gen students and international students? What are universities' uh, policies doing when it comes to safety and harassment on campus? What are people doing with, with regards to the hiring process, which we can definitely get into that. Uh, so that's one trend that I'm noticing, from, especially from teaching here at Northeastern. The second trend, uh, I, I have felt emotionally in recent years, and it's one of the reasons why I incorporate uh, an intergroup dialogue style classroom where personal emotions and identities are actually part of the class material that we cover, and students, as well as myself, we are invited to share that in, in the pursuit of building a community in the classroom where you're not just going to learn facts and history and psychology, but you're learning, like, what am I actually going to do with this in the future? How can I actually live and embody this praxis, we call it, of, of, of taking theory and then figuring out how am I actually going to practice this in my real life? How will I actually live anti-racist values, behaviors, and how can I actually change policy? Uh, how can I actually have that difficult conversation with my parents? Um, so the second trend that I'm noticing in, in the classroom is the, the very real uh, fear and emotion that students are bringing that, that also exacerbates my fears of, of, the, of the er, the, this new era of white supremacy and Trumpism. I'm going to name it. I'm sorry you invited me. Thank you, by the way. Because <laughs> um, it's very real. Like when, when we see events like George Floyd, the, the, the insurrection, the, the tw this case of uh, race no longer be being able to be included in admissions, you have to think as a person of color or as any non-person of color who's an ally, like this is scary stuff. So sometimes it kind of unravels in the classroom where a student will start to realize like the opportunities that I thought I had when I came in as a student at Northeastern, my own community and people in my family might not have access to those same opportunities because of what's going on in the government. What adds a layer of fear is two things that add a layer of fear. One is that, um, that it's the people who were elected into the Supreme Court, the current rules are they're supposed to be there for life. So how long will this era last in history? We, we don't know yet. The second thing is uh, the attention to, uh, this, and this is, this is for the, the scholars, especially in the room, is that there is an important need to attend to the emotionality and mental health of the students in the classroom. Like uh, if you wanna try to create a classroom space where difficult emotions can be processed, you make sure that there are opportunities to, to name those emotions. There is a whole field you can all look up called pedagogy of vulnerability. In pedagogy of vulnerability, which, which has aspects of intergroup dialogue, you are allowed to express complex and complicated emotions. You're allowed to feel numb. You're allowed to not know what to do with all of this that's going on. You're allowed to say to the class, oh my goodness, it's affirmative action, it's gun control, it's reproductive rights, it's drag queens, like it, it, it keeps stacking up, it's climate change, I could keep going, but I, I only have five minutes. <laughs> um, so it is very real, the, the emotions that, that, that folks are bringing, and I, and I can only imagine that the intensity of emotion is going to increase going into now we're 2024, it's an election year, what is gonna happen in this country? So I just wanna urge folks to be very thoughtful and conscious about how important it is to be, be able to attend to the emotion of, uh, that students are bringing to the room because this is very, <laughs> this is a tough life to be living right now. Uh, so I, I especially want to thank folks like the educators here on the stage and students who want to take classes like this because hopefully you're finding a space where you can figure out how to actually do something with these emotions that you are hopefully channeling into some sort of um, social change, that, what, whatever that looks like for you. So I'll, I'll pause there. That's great. So from a, a policy perspective, what are the kinds of recommendations that you would make uh, to a university of this scale and scope uh, in terms of next steps that ought to be taken uh, around uh, the replacement of uh, a set of values um, and practices uh, that uh, were previously subsumed under the title Affirmative Action? You know, I think you use the word values, and uh, this is something that our administration has used as well prior to the decision, and then certainly uh, in a full-throated way post-decision. In fact, um, 
uh, President Ayun uh, issued a statement minutes after the, the, um, the, the decision was, was made. Uh, and it reinforced the values. And I have found that organizations, institutions, higher institutions that have, have walked back their commitment, their 2020 commitment, were those that really were not very clear about their values and the core values. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really thrilled to be a part of an institution that, that is. So I don't think that there's a replacement of values here. Um, but I think that those who institutions that don't have clear values should really articulate those. But in terms of policies, practices, we have to be smart and we have to be smarter. Uh, we are making a commitment at, at Northeastern that we, a diverse student body makes us better, a diverse faculty, a diverse uh, staff makes us better as an institution. That's our core value. Now, how we operationalize that within the bounds of the law that's a chance for us to be creative. And guess what? To the point that I made earlier, innovation comes from diversity. So having the people at the table who are really directly affected by this really spawns the kind of ideas that will allow us to do this. And that's, that's our commitment. And I think institutions do. But, but, but very, very quickly, I think that there are three Ps and one R. One is looking at precedent. There are nine states, I believe it was, that have already banned affirmative action prior to the decision. So looking at those institutions, Libby mentioned uh, Texas, I believe Florida was another one that had the top 20%, throw those out. Mm. But there are other institutions that have, uh, states have, have done some creative things to really increase the diversity. Mm. Number two, pathways, looking at um, developing new pathways like our A2M program, in partnership with community colleges and other institutions, historically black colleges, minority serving institutions, creating more strategic and innovative pathways uh, for, for students. I'll find our station year only supports 100 students from Boston Public Schools. It should be twice and three times as large for those students who are near ready for college. And then the third is the, and I mentioned it, is partnerships. I also think that the R should be research. The, the, the Supreme Court um, laid down a call to action by inference of the research that needs to be done, much like Derek, Bowen, Derek Bach and Willie Bowen, Bowen did in 2000 in the shape of the river with 45,000 students looking at the impact, the distal impact of affirmative action on a population of students over years. I think we need to do that as well, mm -hmm. so that we can really bring an empirical um, uh, basis to discussion of why this matters to colleges and universities and tying their practice to the outcomes. As uh, one of the uh, largest um, and, and more diverse institutions uh, within this region, well, what are the kinds of research that you would uh, envision Northeastern undertaking in that regard? Um, so I, I, this is a little bit of a moonshot, but I would love to see leading institutions start to have a dialogue um, uh, that, that gets us a robust critique and reevaluation of merit. Um, and um, this is a point that I actually take from, believe it or not, Justice Thomas, who, um, of course, is known to be a very conservative member of the court, and he is, but he has an underread opinion in an earlier affirmative action case, it didn't come up in this one, um, where he basically argues that, it, he, he's arguing against affirmative action, but he's making his critique from the left. And the argument is, as I understand it, that universities rely on bias admission tools things like the SAT and the LSAT, and whatever you mentioned, mm -hmm. scores being the thing. Uh, and um, those tests, as we know, produce racially skewed results. Um, and then what universities do is call that merit, call that merit, and then use affirmative action to correct for the problem they just caused. That's his argument. And that is an argument, that it's his argument, it's an anti-affirmative action argument, but it is an argument from the left, and I think it's actually quite radical. And if you take that argument seriously, you're really calling into question the, a larger 
sort of, de or maybe a deeper is what I want to say, than a deeper or larger package of ideas about how admission should be done. And I have to say that if he, ha I wish he had done it in this case, I wish he'd reiterated the argument in this case, because I would have liked to have seen, first of all, I would have liked to have seen um, the, the dissenters confront it. Um, dissenters who, by the way, all are products of elite institutions and who may very well be dazzled by merit, right? Um, first of all. And second of all, um, I think that if they had had to confront it, it would have forced them to do a better job with the claim of anti-Asian discrimination, which was really neglected. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, because it, what they would have had to do was grapple with the fact that there is no kind of neutral way to do university admissions. Mm -hmm. You choose what merit is, it is a political choice, and it has distributive consequences by race and by other things as well. And, uh, and so uh, I think that um, we cannot get out of this tangle. We cannot get out of this without a robust conversation about what counts as merit. Um, and so I would like to see, I don't know if research is the right way I want it, but a dialogue about it is what I would like to see. I can add something. I'm gonna add something different, which is, there are some studies from psychology one, uh, that have examined the impact of having actual diverse classrooms and perspectives and friendships that shows longitudinally how it can impact things like comfort with diversity, ability to think in a more complex way. There are longitudinal studies that show this. But you have to create conditions where that is possible. So like just bringing in students from different backgrounds is not enough to have a first gen black student locally from Boston feel comfortable in a classroom where nobody else looks like them, not even the professor. It's like, it, it's, it's more challenging than just the college admissions process. So I agree with what's been, what's been stated so far, mm -hmm. like we do need to consider merit, we do need to look at the outward going partnership. We also need to look inward and figure out how can we examine the different levels at which students are interfacing with the university, classrooms, res life, and, and the places that they're, that they're living in the area where they actually have meaningful opportunities to engage in cross-racial, cross-identity conversations, relationships, friendships, and so forth. And some of that is, in, some of that I think I do think is incumbent on faculty to figure out how do you build it in the classroom. But th that can also happen through through residence life programming. That can happen through honors program. That can happen through uh, all the cultural centers that exist on campus. Where there's also longitudinal research showing that uh, students who participate in um, cultural center activities uh, it, it can help with uh, identity, leadership, and empowerment. Like, it, it's wonderful to have centers like this on campus. Um, uh, we'd love to have more students involved in, in, in these kinds of things on campus. Uh, so uh, I'll add that, but I'll also add another trend that I'm noticing in the classroom, and this is one of the things I love about Northeastern, is our students are demanding that we think about intersectionality in the process, because it's not just race. Yeah. It's like race and income level. It's race and gender and sexuality and religion. So if you're, if you're missing some of those pieces, you might get some level of comfort for some students in some parts of campus, but it's not embedded in their entire student experience. And, and students, will, students will sometimes give us very direct feedback saying that that you know here's an opportunity where maybe you missed out but we, we can we can die, you know have an internal dialogue and figure yeah. out where are the opportunities for us to to correct this and, and and you know make it better for the next generation when you make reference to merit what exactly are you referring to um, well I think the, the the critique I think is about using the standard uh, uh, measurements uh, with test scores in particular having been historically problematic. Yeah, there's this, this is notion that the success of, 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 the success, one success should be based on uh, objective metrics, mm -hmm. right? There, there should be some sort of a objective um, measure of success uh, without assistance, mm -hmm. without um, perceived assistance. What people who make the merit argument, though, don't realize is how much assistance that they receive. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, the, they receive for generations as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, I started college in debt. Mm -hmm. 
right? Mm -hmm. I left college in greater debt. But I went, <laughs> went to school, and it, it took me, frankly, years to pay off. And so it, it really um, weighed down on the kind of decisions I could make, the jobs, et cetera. I went to school with par parents, with students whose parents paid for their college. Mm -hmm. So even in looking at that as a basis, right, um, there is, there is and, and then these people who, 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 who are successful make the case that they were successful on their own merit. Mm -hmm. But the truth is it's not. It's, it's, it's built, merit is built on generations of wealth and access and privilege that, um, that really feed into a person's uh, experience. And so part of my discussion is to kind of, I mean, t Malcolm Gladwell talks about this, right? In, in, in I think one of his book, Outliers. Um, you know, just, just in looking at hockey players who are born in the first part of the year have a bandage over the hockey players born in the second part of the year. And so he sort of makes the case that everybody needed help in getting there. And so making, that, uh, making people aware of that is, is really important. And I think Libby's point is, is well taken, that universities tend to really define their own uh, metric and metrics mm -hmm. for merit uh, as well. I was director of a program at, um, uh, at an institution that offered uh, experiences for rising high school seniors. And it was targeted at students from underrepresented groups. And uh, we were coming, we came under attack by the Office of Civil Rights by how we uh, handled the admissions program. And the person who, who wrote us a letter, it was part of that Ward Connolly area, Linda Chavez area, where they were attacking these organizations. There was a, uh, it was an article written by Linda Chavez um, about University of Michigan's that said, your doctor could be killing you. And the argument was that because on average, African-American doctors have lower MCAT scores, they're, they're, they're less qualified to be doctors. And so in her mind, this very one-dimensional notion of MCAT leads mm -hmm. to sort of the, 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 the quality of your, your medical career is the, this, this, this mental model about merit that is not accurate. And no, none of the data really points that out. So that's an example of, of what I think is merit. I'll add a, I'll add a, I don't know if this is so much a definition, but it's a spoiler to this, which I think, I think Professor Adler was getting at earlier, which is that some of the existing, some of the existing definitions for what counts as merit or qualifications are actually based on the premise of white supremacy yeah. and based on exclusionary practices like using an SAT, which denied entry to many of the elite institutions, even here in the East Coast, of people who were, for, who were not of European descent. And so I remember in the early 2000s going to 2010s, some universities, um, I attend a lot of like student affairs kind of things, uh, talking about using grit or resilience instead of a, of a numerical measure that we know has a bias. What, and there's pros and cons of using things like grit and resilience as, as a measure. Like you can, and I think we should, honor and respect students ha that have come from very challenging and difficult backgrounds and have found a way in whatever income school level that they got to, to perform exceptionally well, demonstrate creativity, et cetera. That's one way to demonstrate um, resilience. There's the fear that it, college admissions then becomes a game of who can tell the most compelling story. Mm. There's also privilege in who gets to write the best essay and who gets the most support for writing an essay such as this. So it, it, it takes a, I do think it takes a multi, multi-dimensional perspective of how to count all of these things without reducing every trait or characteristic to a number in a way that's formulaic, which I think is part of what the, uh, decision is. Yeah, and I'll add to that, that, that you know, even under the prior rule regime, it was already the case that diversity was really watered down because the idea of mm -hmm. racial diversity was, was the way that, that the Supreme Court found it acceptable was to say, well, it's like having, you know, you, you want to have some people who are people from this or that race and you want to have some people who speak French and some people who've traveled and mm -hmm. some people who play the cello. And, mm -hmm. and, and so it was already a very watered down concept. What should a university be looking for <clears throat> now that uh, traditional affirmative action has gone away? Um, 
how should it go about recruiting its students? So the, the, the Department of Education um, was very clear in their question, the, their Q and A document that was was uh, was uh, published right after the decision that uh, the decision does not preclude mm -hmm. universities from targeting diff targeting different groups to really increase its pool, um, and so that uh, I think that and and there was a specific yet. statement yet <laughs> yet and there was yet. And there was a specific statement about programs and, and scholarships and others that, that are still permitted. Um, so I, I, I think that the work that universities should, con are, should be done should continue to do mm -hmm. uh, in reaching out to, to communities of color, to uh, low-income communities, to, uh, to broader communities, the disability community, et cetera, to really uh, increase its pool. The decision, at least at, as I understand it this way, is precludes the use of race as a, a broad category unless it has influenced the lived experience of the individual. So I, I think that, I, I, I don't think that they should to change everything other than doubling their efforts to mm -hmm. really increasing the pool. The diversity of the pool, and and I'll add that there's a there's an issue of how small schools and large schools deal with this. I mean that which is just a huge problem. You can I think if you're running a small college or you can, you can have a very idyllic sort of considering everybody as an individual sort of approach. But if you go to a, a large state university, um, you know I went to a large state university for undergrad. We didn't have interviews. We, didn't, you know, there were no, there, there was no consideration of us as individuals. It was all numeric, mm -hmm. and 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 when and when that program came before the Supreme Court, and they said, well, your your new ruling is basically saying small schools can use race and large schools, which are doing it on a numeric basis, can't. And the Supreme Court pretty much said, not our problem. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that this really comes into play for institutions that have considered race in the admissions process. And I, I don't know what the numbers are, but there are only a, a limited uh, set of, of selective colleges and universities in the country. Mm -hmm. um, out of 3,000 or so, 4,000 or so, so what the, the, the number is, probably a, a, a subset of those, less than 10% uh, less than of those institutions use race as a factor in admissions. Mm -hmm. So we're really talking about the, the, the selective institutions, largely. Mm -hmm. um, I talked to one of my, some of my colleagues across the country, and they're like, they didn't even know there was a Supreme Court decision. I mean, it's just not even, it wasn't even oh on their radar. Oh my goodness. Yikes. Um, yeah, I know. Yikes. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't want to work for them. Um, but but it, wasn't, it wasn't on the radar. Um, and, the, and I also uh, reached out to several of my community college uh, colleagues and said, yeah, we've gotten more attention because predominantly white institutions are looking to create these, these pathways in, 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 in a much more intentional ways than just simple articulation agreements. So they're, they're being creative uh, in building these pathways and partnerships, but I think we're talking about a certain tier of institutions. Yeah, the higher ed <clears throat> model itself is uh, uh, deeply threatened at this moment because of declining enrollments in mm -hmm. most institutions. Um, so what is the impact likely to be in, in a broader sense vis-a-vis uh, the feelings that uh, a lot of uh, elected officials are expressing that maybe one doesn't need college at all. Well, I want to think about, think about it first before I answer, but I wanted to add something to what Carl and Libby just shared, which is something that um, a lot of progressives have been talking about when it comes to uh, finding different fixes to college admissions. And the theme that comes up is ending legacy admissions. Mm -hmm. Ending legacy admissions, which is also a, a way to preserve privilege among elite, white, and wealthy folks. One of the original studies that, um, um, that I sometimes assign to my students looks at, looks at how you get overpopulation of, of white, male, um, able-bodied, rich, did I say rich? 
rich <laughs> students to your university, and it actually does not contribute to the mission of diversity. But, uh, but what, what's happening is I think students are starting to peel back and realize like the dollars come from somewhere. If somebody thinks that you can be a graduate from a university and give a $1 million, $2 million, buy a building, and that's gonna give your child extra points in being able to play the admissions game, like the studies have shown that that has actually worked for a lot of people. So some universities, like in the UC system, I think MIT as well, have, have said, we are, we are no longer going to use legacy admissions or your parents or grandparents uh, graduation from our university as a factor. And the Harvard study shows from, I think, 2019 or 2020, when you remove legacy admissions, it does a great job at leveling uh, the playing field, especially for uh, black and brown students, Asian students somewhat, but like, we will take progress okay. with, with a big policy like, uh, like ending legacy admissions. The, what, what, what is so sticky, I think, for a lot of colleges uh, and presidents is thinking about the money like, and over relying right. on this money to keep their university going. So it's, it, it is, that's the part, I don't have the answer for that part, but I'll, it, it I'll does mean, it, it does suggest that, you know, the, the real change is going to be painful and expensive for universities, yes. right? It's gonna, it, that, that's just the fact. If they're, if they're gonna make real change, they're gonna have to deal with legacy and, yes. and donors, and, and, and they, they have to deal with donors for all kinds of things. And, yes. and the other thing is, the elite schools are not gonna be that excited about giving up on their merit measures either, because that's, it's, it's their merit it measures that feel. made them elite schools. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, those, those are the, mm -hmm. those things are gonna come at a cost, and it's gonna take a certain amount of, courage and willingness to take some hits if, if schools really care about making this change. Northeastern has become one of the most uh, global universities uh, in the world. Um, I think we have more international students here than uh, any other uh, university in the country. How do these uh, new policies and practices uh, impinge on uh, global recruitment and on the sense of uh, what a university is uh, as a global institution. <laughs> That's a good, real good question. Um, you know, I love the tagline, and it's it's true. Northeastern is a, a university like no other. Um, I think that the fact that we have three different undergraduate locations where where students can matriculate in London and Boston and in Oakland is unlike any any other um, the real growth of the international is is the the graduate um, programs um, and um, and that's that's a significant significant um, number uh, in the master's program so most of the uh, global university campuses uh, really have a large number of international students um, I don't think that comes into play at the master's level for the most part, unless we, um, we and this is what we are, uh, we're looking to do, is diversify, again, the, 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 the countries that are represented mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the international pool. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, a, you know, largely driven by Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and that. Um, I know our enrollment management team is looking at um, other, other continents, um, in Europe, in Africa, and it's in South America, and just looking to kind of increase the, that pool. Um, we know, and, and part of that is because of the richness of the experience, right? If, if, um, if two materials are in the same temperature, they'll never change the temperature. Um, but if two materials are, are, are juxtaposed and at a different temperature, there's going to be a, 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 a heat transfer. And I think the same is true for the social conduct, social transfer. The social transfer occurs when there are differences in backgrounds and experiences, and we get that um, as, as a university. But I do think that it will come into play um, mostly in the undergraduate. Um, I think the last, last I heard that we had something in the order of 96, 98,000 applications for about 2,800 wow. undergraduate position slots. And wow. so that's a really, I mean, that's, that's, that's bodes well to the university on the one hand because Northeastern is in demand, but it creates these challenges uh, because we're becoming more and more selective. Uh, and the current class, first year class, is the most diverse we've ever had. Um, 
And so despite, or beca despite the fact that we've seen a growth in number of applications, we have, again, adhered to our values. Now, having a situation where we are blind to the race and ethnicity of the applicants yeah. until they make a commitment, um, it, it remains to be seen what impact that will have as a university. When our students arrive on campus, both undergraduates and graduates, what are the uh, recommendations that you would have for a university in terms of building that sense of belonging um, and building a sense of community uh, among uh, individuals who are coming from so many different places uh, and, and despite the affirmative action uh, rulings, uh, there's so many different groups. As you mm -hmm. said, we've got uh, now the most diverse uh, entering class that we've ever had. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for building a sense of community here? Uh, it's finding your community on campus, going to a cultural center, finding your group. Students have been very active. I, I've only been here six years, but I have found students to be very active. If the group doesn't exist, they will create it. So uh, there, there, are in, there are now intersectional groups on campus for people from you know, certain combinations of, of race and, and gender or race and, and sexuality. And I don't remember these existing 20, uh, 20 years ago. So that would be my advice to all students is as part of the process of figuring out where you belong on campus, finding that sense of, sense of belonging is in the friendships and the networking that you can do. For some students, and we know this from campus climate research at, you know, in general, that also finding a mentor who either looks like you or can represent some of the identities or experiences that you have matters so much. Like Sometimes it's matching based on race or ethnicity, but sometimes just to have another a uh, queer scholar in the room or somebody who grew up as an immigrant and was the first in their family to attend university. When, the, when that professor shares that story in the classroom, that forms bonds with the other first generation uh, students in the room. And, and oftentimes they're looking either for like formal mentorship, like how did you figure out that you wanted a degree? Sometimes that's also informal mentorship by, by us showing up at events and asking students more than just inside class, you know, how is their day going? You know, how are they figuring out Boston? Boston also is a very interesting city for not only our international population, but for students of different races who live in other parts of the country. Coming here, experiencing the weather, and experiencing um, like the, the apartment game in town, there are, there are things that I think <laughs> that we can prepare our students to, to know in advance so they can make a, a very sound decision and also find where, where, you know, where can they live, where can they worship, where can they eat in a way that supports uh, their values. So look, there's a concept that we call this in psychology called self-preservation. It's not that finding an affinity group is self-segregation. Oftentimes people of color or people in any minority group, you get so much from being in a community of other people with similar experiences, whether it's the same age or like a mentor, it helps you feel wedded to that um, campus. If I had more time, I could share tons of examples of in my class, a student saying, oh, I didn't know there was a Haitian professor. Like, I'm gonna, I need to look this person up and go to their office hours. Or I didn't, I, as an Asian American professor, I sometimes get ran, random Asian American students from other, uh, other di departments who just find me somehow and want to talk about life in my office. And my colleague across is like, who is this? And like, they just wanted to chat. And it's okay, like, we do this as, as part of our job. Um, but, but, I, but I think, uh, we also want to be transparent about the process and inf be informative and accurate about um, the, the opportunities that exist and the opportunities that can be created uh, during their time. Yeah, and, I, and I'll just say very, very quickly that uh, my, my dissertation research looked at the success of African American males in higher education. It was really based on some of the work uh, around self-efficacy, which is agency, mm -hmm. which is what Matt Lee talked, Matt talked about, but also about um, what I call vertical and heart vertical and horizontal integration. So the students who are successful, and by the way, this applies to employers, faculty, staff, et cetera, mm -hmm. really is predicated on the quality of their interactions vertically. That's mm -hmm. their managers. You talked about mentors. Mm -hmm. Anyone sort of in an evaluative relationship or non-evaluative relationship that has that connection. Uh, and, and so, and then their quality of their peer connections. Um, one mm -hmm. of the things that we don't do well is that we don't make that an intentional part of mm -hmm. the onboarding. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so the, we see this in the summer bridge students, the 270 students who were admitted as part of that one week experience during the summer, they built community. So the vertical and horizontal integration was there, institutional integration was there. And those students have, even though many of them are first generation, et cetera, have a 90 percent, 90 plus percent retention rate, a very successful graduation rate that goes well beyond the average across the university. So because of the community is there. What we really need to do is get that to scale. Mm -hmm. I hosted an event at the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, an open house when we moved to 271 Huntington, Huntington Ave. Went from 12 to 2. At 12.00, 25 Indian students, masters and, and PhD Indian students show up at 12.00, and they stayed till 3 o'clock. We ended at 2 o'clock. They stayed at 3 o'clock. And so I started, to, again, the sociologist in me started to interview them. Mm -hmm. Why are you here? What, what, what about this? Said, we don't have a place. We don't have a community. Mm -hmm. and, and if you're any, ever near Panera Bread, at the end of the day, that's the community. Mm -hmm. We need to do better as an institution. <laughs> we need to really build that. Um, that community. I know that's on Madeline Estabrook's radar mm -hmm. to create a community for our international students, mm -hmm. but that's really what we have to do to build those art of uh, those primary connections and be very, very intentional about that in, in, in other places. Uh, Rasha Price was um, in, a, in a program that we, 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 uh, we sponsored um, called with the partnership. Um, over the last uh, three years, uh, Northeastern has sponsored a program for um, uh, people of color who are in a uh, professional, um, professional, professional role at various levels in the professional role. And I felt that it was so very important for them not just to have the connection with this organization that's been around since 1986, but with a community here. Mm -hmm. And so we started to have um, biweekly meetings with those who are in the cohort and they built a relationship among themselves. It's not a heavy lift to do that. Mm -hmm. It's not a heavy lift to create community and help to facilitate that. And that really applies to someone like me who was introverted, shy, and did not have agency um, in, in college. And, uh, and I would not have reached out to the community except for the living group that I was a part mm -hmm. of. So there is a whole bunch of people from a personality point faculty, staff, and students who are not naturally mm -hmm. comfortable doing that, we have to really facilitate that and create a catalyst for that to happen. I know we have um, some <clears throat> questions or thoughts from our audience, so yes. Um, bring the mic. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you all for, for coming to speak. It's really, uh, really a great discussion. Um, my name is Ethan Wayne. I'm with, with the Huntington News. But the question was, um, recently the Northeastern Chief Enrollment Officer, um, Satyajit Dadagupta, said um, to the Faculty Senate that while race can be taken into consideration through the essay, that's, they're not trying to use that as a proxy in the admissions process, kind of to what you were talking about, circumventing the Supreme Court. So for Northeastern students who are worried that there hasn't been a specific path set forward. Um, is this on purpose? And if not, how might students expect Northeastern's uh, population to evolve in the coming year or two? And if it is, how might we expect Northeastern to kind of walk this fine line moving forward um, between setting policy and uh, you know, complying with the law? Thank you. Wow. That's a you know, an admissions I, I person? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> None of us are in admissions, yeah. so it's, it's kind of hard to, I don't know, do you? Like yeah, I don't. I don't feel very comfortable um, speaking to that. I, I will say that um, they're very smart people. So, so <laughs> first of all, let me back up and just say the nine in nine states when the laws were passed, there was a, a precipitous drop in mm -hmm. the representation of the next year's class. Mm -hmm. So University of California, I think it's Proposition, mm -hmm. what was it, 209, mm -hmm. uh, prop, um, the Prop 2 in Michigan, there was a precipitous drop. And we hope that that's not the case here, but, but if precedent will carry forward, there will, really will be um, a, a drop. But there was also a progressive increase. Uh, as well over the, over, the, over the subsequent years in many of those states. Um, in some cases, it didn't return to what it was before the law, but there was, there was an increase. Um, but I do know that they're, that they're looking at that uh, creatively, and um, 
and and there are there are ways that um, unfortunately, and I'm not saying that this is the case for. I don't want to speak on behalf of Northeastern, but the fact that uh, a Supreme Court says that we have to use race-blind approaches in a country that is so racially sanctioned in everything, from zip codes to the quality of the schools to there are so many proxies, suggests that we still have a problem that are institutional that, as, as Professor Adler said, goes back hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. The truth is we can't use proxies, I think, in, in, the, in, the, in the classic sense, mm -hmm. but um, there are creative ways to ensure that the class that's coming in are diverse. And I, I don't know what those are. I can't speak on behalf of Northeastern, but I, I have confidence in the leadership here. Sir. Thank you. I'm Gregory Abau, Dean of the College of Engineering. I really appreciate this conversation. I want to um, reflect on two things that I think cause a, a, a real problem in my mind. One, Carl, when you talked about we need to increase the pool, that's great. Uh, um, but that's going to increase the number of people. And then we go back to scalable, merit-based selections. I think the, the big, biggest problem we have is that uh, um, uh, you need to have a scalable way to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And you can't look at each case for hours on end to make a decision as to whether that person it, it has the merit that you want. So if we go from 98,000 to 120,000 applicants and we have, we, we actually admit about 6,000 students who so count NU in and whatever, I, I just don't see how we can create a, a good solution unless we come up with scalable ways to do these proper merit-based um, admissions. And and just to be clear, Gregory, uh, Dean Abowd, uh, Abowd, I, I was referring to increasing the diversity of the pool. Uh, in, in other words, through targeted outreach, through messaging and promotion, et cetera, the pool could be diverse so that when the decision is made, it's made in, in a in a whatever the merit, whatever the factors are, but from drawn from a, a pool that's more diverse. Uh, but but I think that um, that's a really good point um, that really got at the 2003 decision of the Supreme Court, where a university like Michigan was using a point system mm -hmm. because of the numbers. It was Michigan. The volume. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I thought you said like Michigan. It was actually oh, Michigan. Oh, it was Michigan, yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, so like Michigan. Um, yeah, go blue. But, um, but, but just, just, yeah, and, and that's, that, that, that was ruled unconstitutional. Yes. Hi, I'm Samira. I'm an undergraduate student. Um, thank you all for talking here. I, something that really stuck with me that Multiple of, you, multiple of you mentioned was, in order to really combat this, there needs to be the university level desire to create this change and make sacrifices, such as with legacy admissions and using those donations. Um, maybe not for Northeastern specifically, but nationally, do you, do you see that willingness there? I guess maybe my faith in higher education is not very high, but do you, see that trend happening or coming? The incentives are perverse, I'm sorry to have to say. I mean, mm. I, I hope that there will be, you know, I mean, there are different ways that it could be approached. One could be that the top universities, you know, kind, mm -hmm. of, kind of join hands and jump in the pool. Um, that's, um, that didn't work when it came to um, dealing with the Solomon Amendment, which was the, um, the, um, the rule that was going to punish universities that didn't l allow the military to recruit on campus when the military had its anti-gay policy. Um, there are antitrust issues as part of the reason, I think, but, uh, but, there, but the, um, uh, it, so that's one way. The other way is for, you know, not ev the elite universities don't educate most of us. And, uh, and so, you know, maybe there are universities who don't have such a profound stake in the hierarchy, the, 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 the prestige hierarchy of higher education, 
that will be willing to make some moves, um, some very progressive schools. Mm -hmm. My guess is they'll be small, um, mm -hmm. kind of independently wealthy. I don't know. I, it's, just a, it's just a guess. But it, right now, the incentives are really perverse. It's, it's a shame. I mean, a U.S. News and World Report is the bane of, of, of mm -hmm. the higher educational system, in, in my view. <laughs> And, and one of the things I'll, I'll just say quickly is that when the pandemic occurred, uh, hundreds of colleges and universities went test optional. They 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 That's decided true. to mm -hmm. um, to eschew the the SATs uh, to admit. And and in most cases, the number of applicants went up, mm -hmm. and the diversity of the applicants went up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think until recently, Northeastern has continued to be test optional in that in that regard. So I think that there is some hope. Uh, it required a shock like the pandemic, um, but, but most major changes, really, if you look at the history of America from, from Sputnik to the Civil Rights Movement, et cetera, really occurred when there was some sort of a, a shock uh, to, to the system that required folks to change. Um, Scott Gall Galloway wrote in the book Post Coronas, he says, we went from uh, making changes in decades to making changes in weeks. Mm -hmm. mm. You think about telehealth, you think about mm -hmm. uh, financial reporting, you think about schools and colleges, et cetera. There is a, you know, you'd hate to bring on another pandemic, God forbid, but there is a, there is a, there is a, I think this is another shock to the system mm. that really will lead to innovation. I do believe there's going to be some innovation that will occur in higher education. Yeah. One other point I want to make about one, one thing I'm taking away actually from both your comments uh, is that there is another way to think about putting pressure on how this country thinks about admissions and higher education. There are countries like Germany and Ghana where you don't have to pay the same kind levels of tuition to attend uh, institutes of higher education Canada. that you do here. Yeah, exactly. The second thing I'll just mention is that when students organize, students put pressure, universities will sometimes divest. So I, I'll give you an example from my time in undergraduate. There, there, was, a, there was a time when I, I don't remember what was the precipitating event, but sometime in the 90s when I was in, when I was in college, my campus, which was a state school, was anti-Coca-Cola. And we organized and we got the administration to listen to us. I know there was a sit-in at some point, And we stopped serving Coca-Cola. And it was like Pepsi everywhere. And it, it, was, polit <laughs> it was political that we did this. Um, I, I don't know what we drink here. But like, it's political. And so the, the point I'm making is there are lots of other examples from history that we can look at with Vietnam War, with what happened with the development of, of ethnic studies and University of California system, of lots of movements of students, sometimes students working with faculty or with staff to, to organize and say, hey, this is important enough that we should rethink what the system is. And we can look to other countries, other perspectives for, for college. I mean, wouldn't it be great if we had college be free to everybody in this country in the same way that other countries do it. That removing debt, which is also classist and racist and all these other things, if we say we're a country that really believes in democracy, why don't we actually create policies that, that set a, a more level playing field? So your vote matters in, in this whole process also. Yeah, student activism certainly matters. Maria had her hand up and then Uta. Thank you. Maria Ivanova, I'm the director of the policy school here. And as a former international student in this country who came from Bulgaria right after the wall fell down in 1992, and someone who, yes, had trouble with that sense of belonging, I want to focus on that part of the DEIB equation. Because at Northeastern, we do have people from around the world. We have undergraduates, and that's become ever more competitive, and yet we have graduate students from around the world, and that's an area that we want to grow, and we are growing. A qu more than a quarter of our, of our students in the policy school are international students. So can you share with us any best practices, any examples that you have seen of what this university or another university has successfully done to increase that sense of belonging? And what can we learn and take across the university, across colleges, across units, the law school, the business school, the policy school, this, the engineering college, the social sciences? 
What has worked? The, so I, I used to be part of a group. Um, I used to study this at my prior university where we were looking at best practices for uh, inclusion and belonging, specifically for undergraduate international students. So the research from psychology on this is very mixed. And it's also very new, the people that are studying this. And some of the sample sizes tend to be very specific to, to small universities. But I can summarize some, some of what, what, what um, is known in the literature, at, at the very least. Some of it's probably anecdotal as well. Um, uh, sort of companion slash community members becoming like adoptive families of international students. So sometimes what happens to international students is the dorm is closed or you, you like we close for November or winter break and there's no place to go. It's too expensive to go home. So having a local family member, whether that is somebody actually from the community or a faculty or staff person, invite you over for a holiday event, give, give and provide an opportunity to share your culture or language that, that tends to be something. Having uh, language and study groups on campus, some of these also have this, the psychological effect of bringing multiple people who might feel like they don't know how to reach out. Like the, we, we, we got a lot of students like this who might have been the only Vietnamese student from this place or like the only whatever student would, would find a place where they could have lunch. Um, they actually had a space in the cultural center on campus. They could actually, and, and they could meet each other. Uh, we tried doing, I remember the international office trying to do partnerships with um, <laughs> the dining facilities on campus. That is a big set of questions to ask because you, you really want it to be authentic and, and, and quality food and not watered down. So, but, that, but these kinds of markers of culture, um, like in some, and it, it tends to be a lot of these markers of culture where students feel like they can continue to practice their culture, but also find a way to, I don't want to say assimilate, but like find a way to adjust yeah. to what it's like to be an international student in a space that's not your own, but you still feel included as part of the community. Um, and we can talk more about this afterwards. So there's, a lot, there's a lot more um, that we could be doing. Yeah. Yeah. Uda? Well, thank you so much to the panel and to all of you for the great questions. Maybe just two facts in this context that we, I think, that are important to remember about the Northeastern and one of them I feel is really not well enough known, which is that as a university, we meet the need of Pell Grant recipients, um, not with loans at this point, but with grants, right? And so these kinds of facts are important, I think, in terms of continuing to encourage people to give an application a try, um, just in terms of what you were saying, right? That the diversity of pools matters greatly uh, in paths forward. And um, also for students who are going for early decision, families can have the impact evaluated before actually making the decision to apply for early decision, because early decision, that's important, not just at Northeastern, but in general, selective universities have moved for better or worse, this is another whole discussion to a heavy reliance on, um, on um, early decision. And then I just wanted um, to remind us, for example, in the College of Social Sciences and Humanities, there is an international student um, circle that Justin Rapici runs that is exactly along the lines of what you are talking right. about, right? Which is about bringing domestic and international students together, having some fallback um, or some, some meaningful experiences around holidays when you mm -hmm. can't return. Again, some of these are, things are harder to scale depending on the percentages that yeah. you have in different mm -hmm. contexts, and that certainly looks different from university mm -hmm. to university. But I'm really grateful that all of you have given us an e evening of critical thinking and also of thinking about solutions at the same time. So Ted, would you close us? Because I think we need to yes. probably close for our audience at this point. I, I will thank our panelists for uh, addressing the core issues um, and uh, putting forward some recommendations um, on uh, specific uh, policies and procedures that we might want to think about uh, adopting in this uh, new world of uh, post-affirmative action. And I want to thank the audience for being here um, on a uh, snowy night uh, in Boston. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.